these conversations, the ones that you and I have, have turned into somewhat of therapy uh, for me. And I think it's it's helpful to maybe share that therapy with everyone who's now listening on this stream. From a therapist perspective, uh, don't fight the Fed. <laughs> <laughs> I would love the idea. It's it's hilarious to think about a therapist out there using the phrase "Don't fight the Fed." But I think you know, for everything that we've been through, that is literally all advice. me and my therapist would talk about <laughs> if I went through. <laughs> Welcome in everybody into another coinage chat. As we are constantly getting throttled by this market up and down, a big sell off to discuss again. Uh, kind of par for the course right now as we're watching all of that play out. And happy to have on with us today, Sean Farrell, Head of Digital Asset Strategy at Fundstrat. Sean, good to see you again, man. Thanks for hopping on. Hey, Zach. Thanks for having me. You know, it's kind of just been uh, one of those summers where if you're looking at the charts, you're not pleased uh, on a daily basis. But when you zoom out, not terribly painful to consider kind of you know, where we're at with Bitcoin around that 60K level. But first, just kind of want to get your take on, you know, what you're making of this price action, because yet again, we saw a pretty swift move from basically 62 all the way down to 58. Um, so kind of curious just to get your take on, on what you're seeing. Yeah, I mean, look, this is largely a function, at least in my view of, um, you know, the seasonality. And when I say seasonality, I'm speaking to, the truly low liquidity environment that we we are in and have been in for quite some time. Uh, I mean, if you look at the move up to 64, 65 on Friday and Saturday, I mean, that was on a relatively low volume day. Um, and yesterday, if you you know exclude the period of cascading liquidations where there was obviously a lot of for selling, uh, it was another low volume day by historical standards. So I think what happens in the summer is, um, you know, you, you get a lot of this choppy price action and, you know, for better or for worse, we're not as, um, since we've graduated to having these ETPs tradable and, and being these, being in, within this larger, more liquid institutional ready market, uh, we, we've kind of forgotten that sometimes Bitcoin has has these choppy days. Um, I mean, the good news is the price action yesterday was somewhat consistent with other, uh, we'll call them soft landing names, which mm -hmm. had a pretty tough follow through following the Fed pivot on Friday. So like IWM, KRE, those both were we're lower on Monday and Tuesday. So directionally, yeah. we're trending with macro. Uh, we weren't seeing that a couple weeks ago, so that's a good thing. But in terms of the outsized movement, uh, I think it's it's just a function of the current market environment. Well, I'm talking too many, uh, I'm talking too many people moves. in the Hamptons right now. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I don't know. The way if they're in alts, not in the Hamptons at all. But if we are looking at that, maybe I'll use that as a segue. Because one of the, if you want to call it an alt, I wouldn't necessarily, but Ethereum has been even choppier. And that's one of those things where I think there wasn't a lot of support for a lot of the names beyond Bitcoin. And it kind of trickled now into Ethereum, I think. And, you know, certainly, as we've discussed before, the Ethereum ETF, I don't think went off the way that a lot of people expected it to. And even you, you were kind of more in the bullish camp on that one than maybe the average person. Um, I was in that camp with you. We were hoping that this would do better than it has, I think. And when you look at the chart on that one, even choppier than what we're talking about in Bitcoin because it's still not really great right now. So what do you make of kind of that overhang now kind of trickling into Ethereum and what that means for the broader market if everything beyond Bitcoin is just having a tough go? Yeah, I mean, the the ETH ETF certainly have had a tough go of it, really have not seen much capital in uh, rotation or, or new inflows, um, uh, which has been disappointing. You know, I think if you look at the story for ETH, this bull market, this cycle, quote unquote, uh, it's just been a very tough story to define. And I think a lot of the folks in the Ethereum community and um, not necessarily asset managers, but it's just been a tough story to tell because it's in this, in this tough middle ground where you have this project executing on their roadmap, but it's still very infrastructure focused. Um, 
it's still very slow. It's you have a lot of liquidity fragmentation, which is very different from Solana, which is just this one integrated platform where you have a lot of apps. And I think that's come into the limelight and you're getting more, you know, you have CNBC quoting Solana prices. So, um, you know, on one side of the spectrum, you have Solana dominating smart contract platforms. On the other side of the spectrum, you have Bitcoin, which uh, is now, frankly, a, a defined, you know, it's, it's an established macro asset. So mm-hmm. I think the story has been tough for ETH. Um, I think I think that once um, we actually get going with the rate cut cycle, and um, we see Bitcoin break out and see dominance top, that's when we'll start to see some, um, you know, the the ETH BTC ratio find a, find some love. Um, yeah, but yeah, in the, in the near term, it's it's been tough sledding. It's going to. It be hasn't yet. It hasn't found much love in a while. But I do think. Uh, these conversations, the ones that you and I have, have turned into somewhat of therapy uh, for me. And I think it's it's helpful to maybe share that therapy with everyone who's now listening on this stream because uh, your price targets are, again, as we've highlighted before at the beginning of the year, I think ETH in that 6,500-ish range for where we end up for Bitcoin in that 115,000-ish range for where we end up. So you still have maintained... There is good stuff to come at the end of the year. And I look at things, and maybe I now play the bearish voice on these conversations, and you play the role of, hey, it's not so bad. Uh, Maybe that's how therapy works. Maybe I should really dig into this because it's been a while. But uh, when we look at maybe some of the reasons to be supportive in price, talk to me about why you are and why you still think we'll see kind of uh, a positive end to the year. I know you've pointed out in your research notes at Fundstrat, looking mostly at stable coins being built on chain right now, minted new money coming in, as well as a little bit of the seasonality. So we can take that in two chunks. Maybe we start with just the seasonality, this being a tough summer per usual. Uh, you had a great chart looking at kind of how that's par for the course in crypto. So maybe we start with there are good times to come if you look at that. Yeah, you know, as as we were just chatting, I think... Um the particularly the um period from around mid august through i guess the, the third week in september that's really the time of year where historically uh bitcoin has not done well you know i think on average september is the only month in which bitcoin is negative um and you know that somewhat correlates with what happens in traditional markets you know generally you have um, you know, a, a seasonal spike in the VIX, you have uh, fiscal outflows, you have um, uh, general market malaise due to the, all the stuff we had just talked about, you know, managers in the, managers in the Hamptons and whatnot. Um, but of course, uh, if, if you, you know, this is one variable, right? It's not, it's, it's seasonality is in many ways kind of this, this blanket, um, uh, variable that that is very multivariate and can't really put a finger on the exact cause uh mm-hmm. so that's why we always try to try to look at you know take a macro uh first approach and and you know understand that macro and uh identifiable macro variables and identifiable crypto specific variables will we'll always take precedent over seasonality but um it's a good explainer for for things that that happen like like what we had yesterday yeah um, well, i think the the other yeah, piece so. there too is you know for things that happened yesterday, I'm obviously talking about the 10% kind of fall off in, in Ethereum prices as leverage kind of unwinds. But the other thing that you flagged is stable coin issuance. And that's another chart that we have or that you made uh, kind of looking at where things are at. There's a couple ones to highlight. One is just the overall total market cap of kind of how stable coins have grown hit a new all time high, I believe, just a couple days ago. And then you also have kind of the daily chart that you had in your research note from Fundstrat looking more at kind of uh, new issuances over a rolling seven days and also just kind of a general surge. I mean, what does that say about kind of the lag factor of like, okay, you got a bunch of people minting stable coins. That means new money's coming in, but it's not going to move the price of Bitcoin or Ethereum immediately. Give it some time. Is that the way to look at it? Yeah. So, I mean, I think um, the, the way I look at it, um, you know, I think stable coin Stablecoin inflows is a, is it a huge high signal variable because it's literally capital moving from fiat economy into the crypto economy. Uh, generally, very high signal for forward altcoin prices. 
I think what's interesting is that over the past couple of weeks, we really haven't seen the follow through on price that you'd be accustomed to seeing with this kind of capital impulse, uh, capital inflow. Um, in a large part, that may be due to the fact that uh, you have this bifurcated market now where uh, it's really, you know, institutions that do not operate within the, the crypto economy that move the price of Bitcoin. Uh, but if the big price of Bitcoin isn't moving, you're not going to get the the wealth accretion within the crypto economy that's going to rotate into these other altcoins. Uh, so uh, I think that's something, you know, we need to think about a little more. Uh, but mm -hmm. but that could be a possible cause for the disconnect uh, between the, the stable coin growth we've seen and um, and the lack of follow through in price. Yeah, you've, well, you've now given our viewers and myself some positivity to think about in terms of, look, it's been a tough summer. We're seeing some chop. We're seeing some leverage unwind here, but new money is coming. Don't fret. Also, already talked about the inflows on the ETF front, though it's been weak on the ETH side. A little bit stronger on uh, the Bitcoin side. Quite stronger on the Bitcoin side, actually. Uh, I mean, when you step back and think about things, there are certain narratives that are being challenged, right? I mean, I think one of them that might be fair to discuss is this idea of Solana. You mentioned that one uh, and kind of maybe what we're seeing in... I think it's probably fair to say, and uh, Texas is a chart that I'll show on my own side. I think it's probably fair to say that, uh, you know, a lot of the run-up had to do with meme coins and Solana. You mentioned other use cases, and certainly there are some when it comes to, you know, all of the D-pin that is being built on Solana. Um, but another big one is just meme coins on Pump.Fun and kind of activity that we've seen there uh, on that chain. K33 had a research report <laughs> highlighting that we've now approached, I think, 2 million meme coins launched on Pump.Fun, which is a lot of trading activity on Solana. Right now, Tron's pushing their own sun dot pump, uh, trying to steal, I think, a little bit of that action over there. None of this really seems sustainable to me, Sean, but, you know, this is something that matters. And there's another chart, too, uh, that kind of blew my mind. I was looking at Avalanche versus Soul and thinking about your, I think, like 600 or something around that price target for Solana year-end. And just looking at Avalanche versus Solana since, I think, you know, 2021. So, these are kind of sister coins, sister chains as I think about them. Um, are you seeing this one, Texas? I'm not sure. No? Okay. Uh, well, you got Solana and Avalanche. Solana's basically surged and left Avalanche in the dust. So I ask you, uh, is there fundamental analysis around Solana to consider? Or is it kind of just what we saw with the NFT boom and bust and meme coin boom and bust? Uh, how, how real is it? Well, you know, I think often... Um, there are fundamentals, but you know fundamentals, and um, uh, oftentimes fundamentals come after price. Price begets fundamentals, right? I think what happened, um, what happened in you know Q4 of last year, Q1 of this year, is that you had a big run up in Solana. You had a lot of people that became interested in Solana, started building applications, started speculating on chain, led to high dex volumes, and so price kind of begets this uh you know activity on chain which which begets more attention and some more thoughts around you know what could be built on chain and um so it's i think you have to take both fundamentals and you know flows into account but ultimately it is flows what matter what matters um you know, and I think uh, it's not necessarily, you don't need meme coin frenzies to, you don't have to assume that the meme coin frenzy is going to come back uh, to assume that Solana is going to keep going up, mm -hmm. uh, right? You just need to, um, you know, assume that it's going to continue to be the preferred platform for whatever is the, um, you know, theme of that week whatever is is popular and whatever is the narrative if that is built being built on that chain that's going to uh accrue all of the attention flows <clears throat> and you know looking ahead i think from um following the meme coin, coin frenzy and following the success that solana had in you know q4 q q1 um in this year to date period uh you've had a lot of people come out and either explicitly or implic implicitly anointed as, you know, the, the number three, right? The, the, the next major. And so I think you're going to have a lot more speculation around perhaps 
uh, investment products being built around Solana. I know, um, you know, a couple of applications for Solana ETPs were withdrawn a couple of weeks ago, but mm -hmm. uh, there are certain, you know, political variables that could, you know, change that calculus. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'm not sure you need a, a meme coin frenzy to to remain constructive on Solana going forward. That's fair. And to go full circle, too, obviously, we're seeing a lot of stable coins now issued, PayPal being one of the huge players that has shifted to Solana as well. So I think all of those things, you know, you don't live and die by meme coins, but I think you're right. It has brought the attention to Solana. It's elevated it enough. And that chart, when I was looking back on like, I could have sworn Solana and AVAX used to have similar market caps and they did back in the 2021 <laughs> cycle. And now not the case at all. Um, lastly, though, Sean, I think, you know, when we think about some of the other narratives that are being challenged right now, you mentioned value destruction. Uh, or maybe that's not the right word, uh, uh, value fragmentation when it comes to L2s and Ethereum. Uh, you got Vitalik kind of on the defensive, which is weird for me. We haven't really seen that in a while. He's kind of quieted down, but he's out there saying, look, Ethereum's in a strong spot. L2s are all the, the reason why we did this. It's all making sense to him. Um, what's the biggest fear for you right now in the markets outside of just, you know, leverage drawdowns in the summer we've talked about it before i'm going to continue to challenge you because of my own fears i'm riding with you but i'm still afraid we don't hit the price targets in year end as i'm sure some of our viewers are i mean what's the biggest fear you have in maybe not seeing the q4 or q3 end play out the way you and you think it will yeah so i guess if we're talking i, th I think people it's interesting if you if you study the Twitter timeline, everybody's pretty bearish, but uh, it does seem to me like the bull case is, is pretty straightforward, right? The Fed has pivoted. Uh, we have inflation falling. Uh, you know, employment and job data is still non-recessionary. So in my view, the bull case is uh, more easily explained than the bear case. So if we're looking at risk right now, um, you know, I see four risks. Four, four or five risks. So one is if unemployment starts to really accelerate, then we could have a situation where cross asset correlations rise and, you know, you have this really acute broad macro drawdown, which, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Bitcoin's not going to be uh, immune to, right? Uh, the, the interesting th thing there, though, is that it's probably short lived. You get some stimulus some easing from the, the Fed, and um, you see a V-shaped like recovery, uh, similar to post-COVID, perhaps not as uh, severe. So from a cyclical perspective, uh, it's not like, like the, the liquidity cycle is ending. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, you have you know geopolitical risk is obviously something that we're keeping an eye on. I think that's one of the reasons that gold and bitcoin have diverged since the start of august you've seen a lot of um you know the probabilities of, of tension escalations in the middle east they, they've risen and you've seen kind of this divergence between gold uh, and the real tenure and bitcoin um so that's something to keep in mind but again also an acute an acute risk um unless it were to really you know turn into something that would um, have have you know an inflationary effect on the global economy um, and then, you know, there's obviously the risk that we could drift all the way back to a stagflationary regime, but you just had the Fed say that they're pivoting. So that'll take <laughs> some time if it does, right? You can't, they, you're not going to have them, you know, double back on what they just said, uh, over the next three or four quarters. It's going to take some time. Um, and then the last risk, you know, obviously there's, there's the political situation. I think, there is a, a acute risk of a drawdown if, if Harris does win the presidency. Um, but again, I think stepping back, I, th I, I do think a lot of people, um, uh, not, that, not that the presidency is not important, but are perhaps overweighting the presidency, underweighting uh, the Senate and the House. Uh, because yeah. if we get a Harris presidency and uh, you know a red Senate and House, uh, you know, Harris is not going to be able to appoint, um, you know, cabinet members and, um, and, and agency positions that would be, would try to debank crypto and, and, and 
would um you know we'd have a congress that would try to to pass you know thoughtful legislation around crypto so i think yeah. marginally it'd be a little better than the status quo so you'd probably have like a drawdown and uh once the market digests the actual political circumstances you'd probably just get back to something similar to the current regime we're in right now okay so there are fears that are at least there but they're not huge and they're not massive and they're not large enough for you to abandon the price right, right zach sorry just to bring it back to therapy i i think um <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like I'm I'm not fulfilling. I, you, you kind of in, 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 imply that my role here was therapy, and I haven't been following through. Uh, no. From, from a therapist perspective, uh, don't fight the Fed. The Fed's easy. <laughs> I would love the idea. It's it's hilarious to think about a therapist out there using the phrase "Don't fight the Fed." But I think you know, for everything that we've been through, that is literally all advice. me and my therapist would talk about if I went to the therapist. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean it makes sense. It, you don't you don't want to fight the Fed, and to be honest, to it, it would be belaboring the pain that maybe some people have felt for them to switch right now. I think bearish. If you're saying there's a bullish setup to end the 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 end of the year, and they'd miss out on what potentially could come. And again, we've already shown the seasonality chart. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I guess I look at it because I assume that there could be, as we just saw with Ton, there are some black swan events that do happen in this industry, and you saw it with Ton. Again, Pantera, one of the smartest, I think, investment firms in the space, huge holder of Ton. The thing, basically, you couldn't have predicted that their CEO was going to get arrested in France. And then I wonder if that has any sort of unwind factor that's now playing out in the rest of the space because the chain halted. And then you had a lot of questions. This is a top 10 coin, Sean. This is not something where it's like, okay, this is some meme coin out there that no one really holds. Are, is there, like, to you, some bit of tie-in between what happened with Ton and the sell-off we saw? Is that fair? Um, I wouldn't, um, I can't say definitively yes or no. Um, but you know, tons sold off on Saturday and we really didn't see any weakness until, uh, late Monday into Tuesday. So market action alone does not speak to any kind of, um, uh, you know, knock on effect from, from the, the Pavel arrest. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I think that, to my knowledge, there's not much. If you look at things from like a, a ecosystem integration perspective, I don't think there's much overlap or uh, yeah, capital flows from Telegram it's mostly, to, to it's others. It's mostly the hamster tap tap to earn yeah. games. I think. <laughs> no. Yes, yes, yes. Um, poor hamsters. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure hamsters are tapping them necessarily right now. Is you know, structurally important. Uh, yeah. No. And and. Um, yeah, I think like from a um, from a, uh, it's not like there was a lot of capital. I don't think held on chain. I'm sure a lot of a lot of the ton was was you know um, held held um, you know in custody wallets and um, perhaps the chain freezing you know slowed up some some settlement. But you know I'm not sure. Uh, I guess I guess getting back to your question is is this having a knock on effect throughout the, the crypto market? I think for particular funds, some VC funds perhaps, uh, but for for um, you know liquid funds and um, you know the broader market, I I, I have trouble connecting uh, point A and point B there. Ken, uh, I'll just end on this though because I know you know we're we're kind of somewhat on time. Um, can it exist, the fact, because I see Ethereum continuing to stay weak. You say that there could be some potential turnarounds that could change that trend line. Um, because it seems like right now there is a risk or fear of a vampire attack, so to speak, from all these L2s that have used and leveraged Ethereum to grow uh, to their size. Base, probably the biggest and easiest one to consider. Why wouldn't they just have all of the funds that exist at Coinbase live on base? Uh, that seems like an easy thing for them to do. And then all of a sudden you got total value locked on base, be huge. Arguably, probably maybe even bigger than uh, Ethereum very soon. Um, So, I mean, like when you consider that and how much people had counted on the Ethereum ETFs and them being so troubled right now, I mean, can Ethereum continue its downward trend line and crypto and the rest of the space still succeed kind of in in the way that you've seen it shape up? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I don't know if, um, don't misconstrue this as a, a bearish comment on Ethereum. I, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't think Ethereum needs to succeed for crypto to succeed. 
uh, if there was a theoretical world in which Solana flips Ethereum or some other chain flips Ethereum, um, I think that the space would march on. Um, obviously, there would be a lot of pain for some particular investors. I think that, um, you know, if, if you look at ETH, I know I know talked about this this story, right? The story being tough to tough to tell, but um, you know, in terms of execution and executing on the roadmap, they've they've done a really good job. I mean, you see a lot of um, you see you have a couple L twos moving to you know what Vitalik calls stage one L twos, where they actually become you know start to derive their security from uh, the L one, which I think would circumvent the the issue that um, that you just described in terms of the, I think you call it a vampire attack, but essentially they would try to derive the, the security from, from their own, that, that L2 and essentially become an L1. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that would circumvent that, that issue. Um, you have a lot of um, just very close to the, the grain infrastructure things that have been worked on and solved and iterated on. You see a lot of, um, there aren't a lot of tr- transactions happening on, the ETH L1, but like that was part of the roadmap. It's all moved to L2. And so if you aggregate all the transactions on all the L2s and the L1, uh, total transactions with the ETH ecosystem has trended higher. So, you know, I yeah. think um, at some point we're, we're, we're going to get a hated rally. There's going to be, um, you know, we're, we're going to recycle the same, um, you know, ETH is burning memes and, and it'll be like, like none of this, ETH hatred ever happened. It's just I don't think it's going to happen until uh, there's a good reason for the ETFs to get flows and for um, you know larger pockets to to reach out further on the risk spectrum beyond Bitcoin. Yeah, no, I mean I think that's it. And like you said, like we opened with, sometimes price begets some of that. And you yep. saw on the seasonality chart, we are not yet in the months where we historically have seen that happen. So getting closer to them though. People got to come back from the Hamptons. Maybe they've done better than I have. Maybe they've got better therapists. But we had a good one on the show today. Uh, Sean Farrell, one of the smartest analysts, I think, in the crypto space. Can't thank you enough for coming on, man. Thank you again. And if you haven't yet, go check out Funstrat, some of the best research in the game. Sean, thanks again, man. I appreciate it. Appreciate that, Zach. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll chat again soon. Thank you to everybody for joining us. As usual, you can check out coinage.media for the biggest headlines in crypto as we aggregate those sourced from our community, including the co-founder of Netflix. You can co-own our uh, decentralized project in one of the fastest growing Web3 outlets in the U.S. Happy to call the U.S. our home. Happy to be a co-op. Happy to be a DAO. Uh, Thanks again, everybody, for listening. We'll see you again soon for Sean and myself. Thank you for tuning in.